Welcome to this live course chapter 3 on 3D reconstruction from a single image. Super excited because here we are going to target three things. Vision transformers, monocular depth estimation and 3D transformation. The three ingredients together will allow us to take a single image and turn that into a 3D point cloud. And at the end we will also how to see and at the end, we will also check out how we can use that for real-time depth estimation with just a camera with a single lens. Whenever you are ready, let's get started on to today's live course. I think you see my screen and I will put that on the side to keep a track of the questions as they come along. Okay, very good. And I will put that full screen. All right, so welcome everyone to this workshop on a 3D reconstruction monocular estimation uh, from, from yeah, uh, using vision transformer, let's say, and with depth anything, which will be the VIT that we use in this case. I, you, you, you maybe all know me, so I will not dive into presentation uh, from my side today, but I'm super, super happy to have Gaetano um, present today uh, the part on depth anything so for the for the short story Gaetano is a student of the academy he went through the collector uh, pack and he was super efficient with all the modules and could develop very quickly but before that he actually has a super interesting background as an art director um, and then he switched to doing a PhD but I will leave the floor to you Gaetano maybe to to present yourself a bit if that's okay with you yeah yeah absolutely uh, yeah, really quickly. Um, I was an animation and uh, art director uh, for a while, started an animation company here in Reno for about 10 years, um, switched, uh, went back into academia, um, got a degree in computer science and really got into robotics and robotic perception. Uh, currently a PhD candidate here at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, doing autonomous uh, vehicle perception or autonomous uh, robotics in general. Um, work of uh, building sensor fusion mod modules, um, specifically LiDAR, camera, IMU, uh, fusion. I'm really excited to share with you guys uh, some of the things I've been working on. I've been working with Florent, helping uh, edit uh, these videos, and uh, hopefully we're talking about putting together a data acquisition course. Uh, so keep an eye out for that in the maybe not too distant future. Uh, good yeah. to meet you all. Super excited about that. Yeah, that's a, a perfect uh, introduction. And that makes me think that uh, right now I'm um, I'm encouraging experts in field. So if you if you if you think there is a specific line that is missing, um, uh, that that will be beneficial for the community to, to grow. I think you can directly reach out to me to see if there is materials to include you in one of the course track as an expert or define a course track on your own. Um, I've been teaching for a long time. I know what works, what does not. So uh, how to set up everything around that. You don't need to worry about it. Just the expertise side, I think. So let's now dive onto the fun stuff. All right. So as always, at the end of this session, you will get the live session recording, whether or not you are part of this uh, side of uh, course lines. You will have the full code with MIT license for those that want to have access to the course. The data set here is an open data set. We'll share the link with you, but I will also put some, some images that I have, which have some interesting parameters to see how it behaves. And after that, all the resources we talk about that will be there, especially the articles, uh, the models that we'll be using and all of these things around and the cheat sheet as always. So what is the mission today? Um, just before, Chris, if you can maybe, um, I can plug your camera. Uh, it will just be for the recording because else I think it will behave in a weird manner. Um, that's just it. So about the mission, we have the what we want to do is starting with a single image. We are not here in a setup that is classical that we have in the along the course line where we have multiple images of the same object. We just have an image and we want to get a 3D object a 3d point cloud out of it that is the mission of today what we will uh, cover so the middle step is that we actually are going to go through depth estimation and then projection that's that simple 
it's not new, monocular depth estimation. There are other techniques to do that. But what is new is the way we handle things. Um, and it's still new, even in the scope of 3D deep learning and AI. So that's why I was thinking it would be super interesting to give that as a tools for you to use, because if you don't have the ability to take a lot of pictures and you still want to create object with 3D, uh, this is feasible, definitely. For metric application, we will talk a bit more about that. So before diving right in the code, uh, I just will explain and mystify maybe the three main concepts that are involved here. The first one being vision transformers. I will very shortly give you some pinpoints to demystify what that is if you did not use it. If you know what that is, then uh, very good for you. <laughs> Monocular depth estimation, um, that also is, is super interesting. That was used for very long as uh, Gaetano knows in the robotics, uh, uh, let's say, community and a 3D transformation and projection. That as well, we were really used in computer graphics to use that, especially projecting with screens, how we do this. But here, uh, there are some interesting elements to pinpoint as well. So that's the three main things that uh, are underlying or the knowledge that is underlying this workshop. A short word about vision transformers. This is a new approach basically uh, to computer vision which challenges the traditional convolutional neural network that were the bulk of uh, the new stuff coming in for image recognition. So it's new in a sense, uh, it's all for deep learning, kind of, but it's new in general because it was introduced, the first paper date from 2021 at ECLR, and it's based on the transformer architecture. So um, instead of building layers and classical convolution on this layer, we have another way with these transformers to handle that. And it works very simply. I took like the overall view is like you, you will split the image, okay, in certain patches. And these patches will then be encoded into vector representation. So that's this simple. And then you go into the transformer magic. So you have an attention mechanism. So what that means, it, it's actually taking everything that comes from the neural language processing and applying that for vision tasks. So this is super interesting. And the attention mechanisms give you the ability to understand relationships in your data, kind of in a way you understand relationships between words. OK, so that is why it's super efficient. And then sometime, if needed, you have the ability to do classification with it. Um, what are the main benefits that I see? Um, is that you have more accuracy today, like you, you can sometimes have four times the accuracy that you will have with classical task performed with CNN, which is huge, and it's much more efficient. So that's why right now we will be able to use a model. We don't train it. That's another uh, pair of shoes, if I may, but uh, in France, is more efficient than CNN usually. And that's it for the vision transformers. If you understand that, I think you get the overall ID. Still down the line, what that is, is still algorithm. OK, it's still computations, but it's a new way um, in a new era. Now, what about monocular depth estimation? So if you see the middle image, uh, this is something classical that we usually do with structure for motion. So we actually change the pose of the image, whereas what we want to do here, we take just one image and we want to infer the depth. And the, uh, the let's say the example that I had is if you look at this picture with trees, actually we are playing on depth cues, what we call monoscoping depth cues. And you have three mains that are used to infer the depth, which is the size of object. So here are the trees. If, if it appears larger or smaller, you will have a guess about um, exactly how far you are from, from the object. Then you have the texture. In this example, you have the grass, right? Grass patch, you have high quality texture or low quality, very blurry at the end. And you have the linear perspective here. It's very, very easy to see that you converge to the horizon. So you have to imagine that we are able, we take just one look at this picture, it's just a single frame as human, we can understand more or less the relationships between objects and how far it is from the point of view. But it's, it would be hard to give a sense of uh, matrix still, but we, we can guess, like I would say maybe between the trees, you have two meters, something like this, maybe three meters, but that's absolutely not close to the standards that you need whenever you, you want to go into super high precision. But with uh, depth estimation, there is, um, let's say, place to think that we will be able to do that sooner rather than that later. It's not the case yet. <laughs> and the last thing is um, 3D projections and 3D transformation. So basically, how do we go from an image to a 3D world? And <clears throat> what is the link, the relationships between uh, the image space 
and the object space. So this is something super, super important. We'll touch a bit on that. You will see that if you mismanage your projection parameter, you have a widely or wide 3D reconstruction that makes no sense, which may be art artistics, but makes no sense. So it's something um, that we need to be, um, to, that needs to be taken care of. All right, so that's the three concepts, vision transformers, monocular depth estimation, and 3D transformation. Knowing that, we'll go into five phases today. First, we'll prepare the environment, as always. Then after that, we go into taking, generating, and in, in our case, taking a data set with an image. But after that, you can just take pictures and try it on your own. After that, we will make sure that we pre-process the image that it's suited for our transformer uh, model, so depth anything, and we will run the depth estimation. At the end of that, the last step that we need to do is point cloud generation. So it's pretty simple, um, and we should be able to fit that all within the next uh, couple of minutes. So that was the introduction, that was the brief, that's out of the way. Now we can get onto the fun stuff, the code session with these five phases that I highlighted. And at the end, this is what I like about this live course slash workshop, is that we have some place to answer questions, uh, exchange a bit on perspectives, without even thinking that it's a joke in this case. But um, after that, uh, there is also the link to get the downloads, the resources, and also taking maybe two minutes. You can already think about that, what the next workshop topic should be. It was planned to be another one on 3D object detection, but because Jean-Jacques is becoming a father for the second time, we're thinking, okay, let's move it one month and let's make the depth uh, anything because it's current, it's CVPR 2024, if I'm not mistaken. So super, uh, super relevant. All right, now it's time for the live action. Gaetano, the floor is all yours and I will then monitor what's happening in the chat, in the questions. Don't hesitate to ask things. This is a sort of brand new technology, um, doing this uh, monocular depth estimation. As you all know, us as humans can do this fairly easily um, from uh, clues uh, with the environment, but this has always been a pretty hard problem for computers uh, because it is, it is um, in a lot of ways, uh, just guessing. It is, it's not, there's no old classical way to get this done. So anyways, let's just jump into it. Let me start putting uh, some code in here. And uh, for you uh, coding along, hopefully you have uh, some of these already installed. Uh, so here are, is our environment setup. Um, yeah, I'm sure a lot of these are, are very familiar to a lot of you. Um, I'll just go through it. We're going to do NumPy just for some uh, linear algebra calculations. Um, we got Torch. Uh, this is PyTorch. It's uh, the Transformers is a hugging face library. It is uh, where depth and anything is currently uh, uh, exists and makes it really easy to use. Uh, we got compute, uh, CV2, OpenCV and a uh, mat plot. We're going to just show some of the images. Uh, we got open 3D, uh, which is going to help us just write the point cloud. I also have a little bonus uh, section where you can do a lot of the things I do manually just using open 3D, but I wanted to do it manually to show you guys some of the some of the math behind it. It's it's not too bad. Um, and then we're just going to use uh, OS random and uh, path lib path uh, just uh, to, to import the data set. Um, so Let's uh, let's import our data set uh, real quick. Um, so the data set I am uh, going to be using is here is a link um, to that data set. Uh, it is just a open data set of indoor and outdoor images. Um, and I am going to show you guys uh, that uh, there are there's some issues with the outdoor images for viewing. Um, but it's it's that's a actually a cloud compare uh, issue, and I have a little bonus for the end of this if we get through it, uh, where I'm going to do uh, some of this stuff uh, live using Ross. Uh, I would like to present that maybe at some point, but uh, I don't think we're going to have time today. Um, so we're just going to do it as a, a little demo. Anyway, so this is some uh, basic uh, uh, path creation and uh, uh, image. Uh, yeah. OK, so yeah, get our data root, uh, get our data data path folders um, and num samples. Uh, we're actually going to double the num samples. So we're going to take three samples from the indoor data uh, list and three samples from the outdoor data. Um, so that's what we do here. Uh, select indoor image, select outdoor image. So we're just random sampling. 
um, from the indoor path uh, with the num samples. So three random indoor images and three random outdoor images. Uh, then we're going to create a, a list for the indoor and outdoor images, and we're going to read those images in using uh, OpenCV. Um, I also am converting the colors from a BGR because OpenCV, if, if any of you have used it before, it imports uh, uh, images as blue, green, red, but we traditionally uh, like to see them as red, green, blue. So I'm just doing that conversion right now, so I don't need to do it later. Um, and then we're impending them to the path. Um, and so let's run this and we will print the shapes just to make sure that everything looks reasonable. So here are the shapes of our images. Um, and real quickly, I'm going to also give a link to. Um, here we go. A link to uh, the Depth Anything GitHub page. It's a really uh, well-made, well-maintained GitHub page. It's only about, I think, a month and a half old, so it's pretty brand new. All of this technology we're doing right now is pretty cutting edge and pretty state of the art for uh, monocular depth estimation. Um, okay, now we're going to just do some hugging face magic. I don't know if you guys have used hugging face before or um, have used it, but they're basically a library that wraps all the new transformers where you can host transformers. Um, and if it's a really good transformer, they put it in into their um, their sort of their pre-trained built-in models and they make it really, really easy uh, to use. Um, and so first we're going to create a uh, auto image processor. Um, we call it processor. So later on when we use processor, just know that this is a hugging face uh, pr processor and we are this Lee Young Depth Anything. Uh, this is the Depth Anything model. There are three models that Hugging Face uh, currently uses. They have a large base and small. Um, I guess I should should have noted that if you're going to be doing this, I strongly rec recommend that you're using CUDA so that you have an NVIDIA GPU. I'm currently running a 3080 Ti, so not cutting edge, but still pretty decent. I have a 16 uh, gigabytes of VRAM. Um, but uh, I will, if we do get to the bonus, I will be using a smaller model for my uh, live demo. Um, but we're going to be using the large model, so the, the full model for this one right here. And then we're just going to uh, import the model, import the preprocessor. They call it processor. It's really a preprocessor for the images. And there we go. Um, here are some details, just printing out some details for the model for you. Um, so we see we have a hidden size. So the, these are hidden layers, uh, 1024. Uh, image size is 518. So that is a weird part of depth anything is it does change your input image size. So we actually have to deal with that a little bit um, that we'll show in a second um, and, and sort of the order of the layers here. Um, for the people who do a lot of uh, deep learning, um, this this will this can be helpful um, and help help suit it to your specific uses. Uh, to the people who don't, uh, don't worry about it. It is just something that we could do. All right, so let's pre-process our images. Um, so we got our, our indoor samples and our outdoor samples. We're just going to uh, loop through our uh, number of samples, which we set up above. Um, and we're going to pre-process the images. So for every uh, indoor image, um, this is uh, basically a, another hugging face thing, just return tensor as, as point. And we're going to put it on our GPU. So this is to CUDA. For, so for people who do not have um, a GPU, you can actually do this on your CPU. It's very slow, but you you just need to um, change this to two CPU um, and it, it you can actually do it, but it, I do not suggest it. Um, so we're doing it for the indoor and outdoor images. And now we are only doing inference here, so we're not training. So uh, this with torch.nograd is basically saying, hey, don't save the gradients uh, from our model. Um, and we are going to get the outputs from the model. Um, so we're going to use those indoor inputs, which we created here. Um, we unpack them. That's what this star star is, is to unpack those inputs. Uh, it's a, a Python uh, thing. Um, and we get our outputs from the model. Now, the outputs from the model is not depth. Uh, this is uh, just a tensor um, outputs, and we have to convert that to depth. And so um, we take those outputs and just do a predict depth. Uh, once again, another hugging face thing makes it super nice, super easy. We don't have to use uh, PyTorch and, and actually do this inference that way. 
And then we get our uh, indoor depth and our outdoor depth images. Um, so now we have these in a tensor, uh, PyTorch tensors is, is this, but we're gonna convert them to NumPy arrays, which we can uh, use really nicely as basically just images. Um, so we're gonna squeeze, uh, this removes one of, of the uh, dimensions. Um, we're gonna drop it on our CPU. Um, and that's basically it. That is how much lines of code it takes to use depth anything. Um, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, we're just going to drop this in in our list of samples that we created up here. Um, and there we go. All right, so now that we have that, let's take a look at things. I know code is so much fun to look at, but pretty pictures are better. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, just one thing here I, I want to highlight indeed. Um, if you started doing research uh, in around 2015 or, or such, the landscape of libraries for deep learning was totally different here. You have to imagine that yeah. be behind .cpu, behind .cuda, behind all of this, uh, there is a lot going on. And now today yeah. it's super easy to get into it because of these abstraction layers. Nevertheless, it can happen sometimes it's super dependent on your hardware whenever you touch at .cpu.cuda. So that may happen that you have some challenges to face and to debug whenever you, you get into, into that. Uh, but now the number of bugs uh, is getting known, so it's easier to, to get an answer about that. All right, so I leave back the floor yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah, Florent, no, that's actually a great point. So I went back to school and actually in um, 2015, 2015 is when I, I kind of shuttered my animation business and and uh, went back to for computer science. And I'll tell you right now, working with a GPU um, on Ubuntu and for uh, yeah, uh, anybody who was there working on it at that time knows about the black screen of death and how many times you had to reinstall Ubuntu and would just get start. Uh, things have come insanely long way just in that short period of time. Um, so yeah, thanks to all the uh, the devs who have really worked hard to make uh, make life easy for us. Um, and yeah, like you said, PyTorch, TensorFlow, these things didn't really exist. Um, TensorFlow, I think, was just coming to light around then. Um, but yeah, things have come a long yeah, way and, yeah, yeah. and doing machine learning has become a lot easier in that short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and that's also, and then I leave again the floor to you. There is also another thing that I really like to pinpoint is that this do not necessarily this innovation comes from universities or like, like, like uh, centers that are open research. It's now this open research mentality is now within also private companies. And I love that because that mm -hmm. speeds up a lot. TensorFlow, yep. PyTorch are two great examples. One is from Google, the other one from Google. Facebook now, Meta. Facebook, uh, Meta. Yep. So really now uh, I, I don't think research is tied down to universities anymore. It's usually in collaboration, but it spans way behind uh, that. Yeah, exactly. All right, so yeah, let's just jump back into it. So we're just gonna loop through for people who've used matplotlib. This is a uh, pretty standard stuff. Um, so I'm gonna create a, a figure um, with, an, with an axis. So it's a plot.subplot. So we're just gonna be doing a one by two. So it's gonna be two, it's gonna be a one figure with uh, two images that are side by side. Um, this is going to be for an indoor image. So we're just going to IM show our indoor sample um, with the, the loop through. So we're going to do the whatever sample we're on. Um, and this zero, um, I guess I don't know if I actually, when I append it, I append the indoor image and the indoor depth. So this is what our indoor sample is. It's a, um, a tuple. Uh, with indoor image, indoor depth, outdoor image, outdoor depth si side by side. So first we'll do the zero, which is the indoor image, and we'll uh, just label it uh, original image, indoor, and then uh, depth image uh, one. And then we'll plot that show. And so this plot that show basically wipes clean our figure and access. This is uh, allows us to uh, then reuse this stuff to show the outdoor images. Um, I loop through it. All right, and we have some pretty images here. Let's take a look at them. Uh, these were random sampled, so I actually don't know what I'm going to get here. Um, but uh, so it looks like we have somebody in a coffee shop on a laptop. 
Uh, now I can already tell you when I show this image here in um, cloud compare the outdoor image, it's not going to look great. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It's because the sky is basically infinite away and the cloud compare is basically going to have to create a sky box, but it's going to make everything else so tiny. We're not even going to be able to see it. All we're going to see is sky. Um, all right, kind of neat one here. We got these flags hiding and looks like what might be a train or a bus station. Uh, once again, anything with the sky, we're going to have some issues with in our visualization. It actually is working OK, um, but our visualization uh, in Cloud Compare isn't going to be the best. Um, so yeah, none of these uh, none of these indoor images are too different. So I may do a resample later to show you guys just a, a good uh, uh, sort of um, variety of, of what uh, depth anything can do. Um, but anyways, yeah, so there are our samples. OK, let's uh, create some functions for us. OK, so the first thing that we know is that if you are going to uh, be uh, doing anything with images, camera intrinsics are very important. OK, so what intrinsics are is you need to know your focal length and you also need to know uh, the, the center of uh, your uh, sensor um, in pixels. Uh, so given that this is a data set where we do not know that, we are actually just going to do some naive calculations for our intrinsics, which actually work fairly well. Um, we're going to talk about uh, some of the shortcomings of it, but uh, we're just going to do some math uh, that is uh, pretty uh, traditional and pretty, pretty, pretty openly available out there. Uh, we're going to, uh, when I say naive, we're going to take for granted that we have square pixels so that our FX, uh, a lot of this is just F and F, but uh, in a tradition, if you didn't have square pixels, you would have FX and FY. Um, and we're going to just say that the center point is in the center of the perfect center of uh, the uh, uh, the sensor, so uh, half the width uh, and half the height uh, of the image. Um, so real simple. Uh, I actually got this function from uh, uh, the depth anything uh, package. It's kind of hidden deep in there, but it's uh, it's it's pretty traditional math. So nothing too fancy in there. Um, all right. And now we're going to define a pixel to point. So we have what we're going to call our uh, pixel space and we have our point space. So a lot of time pixel space is referred to as UV. Um, when you're just dealing with images, they may just call it X, Y, but when you're, uh, we're gonna call our points X, Y, Z. So we need uh, something uh, different for our pixels. So we're gonna call those UV. Um, so we're gonna assume a 55 degree uh, field of view on our camera. So that's another assumption. Um, which may very well not be true, and it will cause uh, some strangeness in our images, but we don't know what these cameras were taken with, so we have to make some assumptions. Um, so that's going to be our assumption. Uh, so let's just walk through this. Once again, this is uh, uh, some uh, some traditional math uh, uh, that we go through here, just using some, some NumPy. If you don't understand the math, don't worry, we'll make all this code available. Uh, you can just copy and paste. So, all right, pixel to point, we're going to take the depth image and the camera intrinsics. Um, we start out just getting the height and width from the depth image, uh, real simple, uh, depth image dot shape. Um, and then if the camera intrinsics is none, we get the camera intrinsics from uh, our uh, function up here. Um, if not, you can drop in your own camera intrinsics. If you're using your own camera and you know the intrinsics, uh, you can drop it in right there. Um, and then we get the FX and FY. Like I said, we're just calling it F and F here, but but in case your intrinsics has something different, we actually are going to use uh, different values. And the CX and CY from the intrinsics. Um, okay, we're going to create uh, a, basically a mesh grid. So we're basically going to create just an image. Uh, it's going to be a blank image right now uh, for our UV space. So uh, we're going to do uh, some lin space. Uh, this is from NumPy, uh, makes it really easy, which is just the length of the width um, and the uh, Y space, which is where the length of the height. Um, and then the UV equals the mesh grid of uh, XY. So it's basically creating an a image, um, but instead of it being uh, like an RGB pixel value, um, it, they're just blank values that we're going to fill. Um, so we're going to do some... Uh, uh, 
uh, some Py Pythagoras uh, sort of rearranged to solve for Z. And so we just need some values. Um, so we're going to do this uh, U value from, from, from the mesh grid. Um, and this is kind of neat because using uh, NumPy, we don't actually have to do any loops to do every pixel, um, considering it is a, uh, a not linear algebra uh, library. Uh, we can actually just do this as linear algebra, which is real nice. So it's going to be U minus CX. So this is actually going to take uh, uh, U, which is uh, all the rows um, of the mesh grid, uh, minus CX divided by FX. And it's just going to uh, give us back that X over Z and X over Y um, as, as uh, matrices. Um, and OK, let's uh, solve for our X, uh, X, Y, and Z, or Z, X, and Y in this case. Um, once again, uh, this is some traditional math. Uh, it's out there. Uh, I know there's, I actually forgot to get a link. There's a nice Medium article on this math uh, that uh, perhaps we'll put in the uh, Google Drive uh, for everyone if you really want to dig deeper into the math. Um, yeah, so we just solve for our X, Y, and Z and return it. Okay, so now for the magic. Um, we're going to do another, uh, oh, let's run this cell. Make sure we're getting our green check marks uh, and we're going to create another function here. So this is where we actually, this X, Y, Z is basically um, going to return three images. You can think of them as images, but instead of having RGB, we're going to have an image of X, an image of Y, and an image of Z. So it's just a 2D matrix, um, but each point will have an X value uh, where the pixel would be. Um, so instead of having a color value, uh, it's it's got an X value. And we're going to create a point cloud um, given the depth image. Uh, I call it a depth image, uh, which is uh, these, this XYZ image instead of RGB. The traditional color image are RGB, camera intrinsic, and a scale ratio. Um, so one of the downsides to depth anything right now is that the depth is arbitrary, which means it's not in metric form. Um, there is another model that, that is hosted on Hugging Face that you can link to through the depth anything model called metric depth, um, which I'm working on getting up and running right now, but, uh, but uh, you can't do it. It's not so easy. You can't do it through Hugging Face. You actually have to get PyTorch. Uh, you have to uh, load the checkpoint into PyTorch and uh, infer things through PyTorch on your own. Also, not that bad. Um, but uh, the hugging face is, is simpler, and it's one we're going to be looking at today. So perfect case scenario, this scale ratio would convert that depth into meters. But as of right now, um, that depth is arbitrary, and so there is no set scale ratio that can convert it to meters. I just use scale 100 in this case uh, because it looks good in the visualization. It seems to be a relatively close size to real world. It is not real world, but it's it looks good. So we're just going to take that there. Um, so similar to up above, we get the height and width, um, we get the camera intrinsics if, the, if they're if they're not given. Um, and so here's an important part. Uh, I'm going to scroll back up here real quick is in this stuff, we have this image size 518. Uh, this is the, the size that um, uh, depth anything it was I believe was trained on I guess that's that's not a, a actual fact but I think that this is where it was trained on um, and so it resizes whatever uh, your shortest um, I believe dimension is to 518 and then changes the other dimension to something else so this this can cause some issues uh, later on and if you have camera intrinsics you may want to rescale the depth image um, to the to the size of your camera, but we're going to rescale the color image to the size of the depth image uh, in this case, and that's what we're doing here. We're just doing a OpenCV resize um, of the color image to the width and height of the depth image. Um, so that's uh, what's happening uh, there, um, and we want to make sure that the depth image does not contain any zeros because right here, when we do this divide, we would uh, do the cardinal sin of dividing by zero. So we just do a uh, another nice NumPy function uh, where we take either the maximum of the depth image or uh, uh, one e uh, to the negative five. Um, so just a real small number close to zero, but not quite zero. 
So if the depth image is smaller than this, we're just going to replace it uh, with that number there. So now the depth image actually comes in as not depth, but scale ratio over depth. So if you just visualize the depth image, it'll look like an inside out pillowcase. Um, so we have to uh, divide a constant uh, by the depth image to get something that is uh, more reasonable to what we uh, think of as depth. Um, okay, and now we're gonna call our pixel to point uh, function up here. Uh, we get X, Y, and Z values out. We call it with the depth image and the camera intrinsics that uh, we created right here. Um, and so now we get our X, Y, Z, and this is, uh, we're gonna stack that X, Y, and Z. What this is doing is essentially creating a, what we, what I talked about earlier as a image, but instead of an RGB image, it's an X, Y, Z image. So it's just uh, basically, uh, three black and white images stacked on top of each other. Um, but in this case, it's X, Y, and Z images. Now I have this little thing co commented out uh, right here. Um, this is something I use in, in my robotics code that I, I will demo really quickly at, at the end here. Um, but, but because of open uh, 3D's ability to create us a point cloud, we don't need to use this. But uh, this is basically concatenating the point image and color image so that we have an XYZ RGB image. Um, yeah, but we're not going to use that here. Um, so yeah, so now we got our nice point image of XYZ. Um, we're going to use our open 3D package up here to create a point cloud. Uh, we just call it cloud. Um, and now we fill that cloud with our points, uh, which is our point image. Um, we reshape it so it's no longer a matrix, but it's now a list of points. That's what this reshape is doing. Um, if we know about what point clouds are, there's just they're just a long list of, of points. And we do the same thing with color. Uh, we divide the color by 255 um, because in this case, the point cloud uh, likes our color to be a, a, a float uh, between uh, zero and one. Um, so now uh, I, I'll talk about this uh, this mask um, in a little bit, but before we do that, um, let's uh, output our cloud. Um, so we can do our output path is uh, to to our old path, um, our data path, not our old path. So it's data root. I'm just going to call it cloud. We just make directory check to see if that directory exists. If it doesn't exist, we create it. Uh, and then we loop through, uh, we create point cloud, our function we just create right here. We do indoor sample um, uh, of, uh, yeah, of the depth image uh, first and then the uh, color image. Um, and we write that to a disk. Um, so let's go through, we'll write them. Uh, let me open up a cloud compare real quick. Um, there we go. Uh, and let's uh, take a look. Uh, let's see how how these samples end up looking for us. Uh, so if I go up here into data, here are all our samples that just got written. And we're going to look at the indoor samples first. Um, and then we'll talk about, oh, here, let me pop the cloud compare over here so you can guys can see it. Open up cloud compare. It just uh, asks us, I'm sure you've seen this, our uh, imply all. And actually, is this a indoor sample? This is actually kind of looking bad because live demos uh, never go the way you want them to. So let me um, let me just try another sample and see how we are looking. Um, delete, delete. Uh, huh. Let's see here. Point cloud. Okay, okay, here we go. Um, let's get, so the one we are gonna be looking at is, let's take a look at this. All right, so we got our sample here, is definitely the bathroom uh, one. Let's jump back to our code real quick and take a look at um, the one we're looking at. Okay, so we got this sample here. Um, and I'll refresh this and do some some new ones. I'm not sure why these 
didn't uh, work well. Uh, the only thing I can guess is it kind of thought that this background was much further uh, than it actually was. Uh, but anyways, so here we go. We got depth anything in a point cloud uh, version uh, with the background there. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it looks pretty good. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. There is still a lot of sort of strange things. Um, and this could be intrinsic issues uh, because we didn't know the intrinsic, but we noticed that these walls aren't super flat. Um, it looks like this stuff right here is real nice. Got a real nice counter, nice sharp edge. Um, so one of the things that I noticed about almost all monocular depth uh, strategies right now is that it doesn't have hard edges. So the edges of objects, let's look back over here. These edges actually aren't hard edges. They are gradients. And so what ends up happening is we actually get um, uh, sort of fall off at the at the end of all these edges. And these are things you can filter out, but it won't just cut off an object and then go to the background. You'll get a a, a constant uh, sort of flow from that to the background. Um, anyways, let me uh, let me try to just uh, restart and I'm going to run all to get us some more uh, image samples here. Um, um, yeah, I think yes. Gaetano, what we can do is um, move on to the questions um, as I see the time flowing and after that we can move back on to uh, maybe showing a bit of Ross and how it interact with Python. Okay. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. If you if we got some questions, yeah, let's jump on okay. the questions and so, um, then yeah, we'll do a quick demo at the end. Perfect. So, so I will share my screen quickly. Uh, I don't know if you yeah, can see it, guys. Yeah. Yep. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Great. I will I can see it. enough to see the question as well. Uh, one thing, though, uh, because uh, Benoit, you, you you said it's a spin off very quickly. I have um, a local environment with a like a very similar setup. The only thing is I put my images. Uh, I have, as you can see, some images, and I just right now took an auto image and uh, something that I got from the segment anything uh, course uh, and another one. So let's pin up. I didn't test it yet, so it may break. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's see how that happens. Live, live demos. Live demo. So it looks like at least the script works. Normally the plots, we have depth, as you can see here. It looks like it's picking up depth here as well. So that looks nice. And here is the open 3D window. So let's explore that. <laughs> you, you, okay, you, it's artistic. It's artistic, exactly yeah. what you said. It's rounded edges. There is a projection error, which is absolutely normal here. It's an auto image. Here I use the central perspective. Um, and this, I just want to show you something then. So I just take index zero. So that's the first image that is plotted. Um, here, that's my intrinsics. As you can see, width, height and that's my focal length so if i move it up a, a notch you will see the impacts intrinsics will have on uh, on the results so you can see already the center of perspective if i move it up even even stronger let's say 80 centimeter let's see what it does you see that it's wrapped massively so if we are in a projection like uh, what we have now maybe we can soften it up a bit but then you have something super flat and this highlight the second thing we have non-metric um, predictions which means that even the relative elements within the scene it's very hard if you have no comparison plane you, you need to somehow still constrain a bit if you want to use it uh, properly so i wanted to highlight that let's take another image and go at 30 millimeter maybe so that's the other image um, that we had Again, you see what is interesting is that you pick up the signal that you have trees or things like this. And I find that amazing because it's a single image. Remember, I come from um, the community that use a lot of images. So getting something like this from a single image is already super cool. Still, you have to constrain it a lot. So that's the uh, first result you get from now. And the other one, what was it? Um, oh, sorry about that. Yep, let's run that. Yeah, that's a classical. That there is a restaurant in Toulouse that called the B Band, where you have nice things, uh, artistic. It was just a, a picture I took, and it, I mean, I have the the laser scan of all the places. So I could do um, a deviation analysis, 
but you already see yep. here that you have something super wrapped because of the projection center. So I think these are the two things to take into consideration, having something much more constrained on the transformer, uh, transformation side of things and constrained in terms of matrix estimation. Doing that, I think you, you will be able to use this depth image for a lot of things, especially to speed up any SFM workflow or dense matching algorithm that right now uh, functions with regard to the other images. If you can take that out of the equation or speed up the workflow, that's a massive boost. Um, yep. right there. And to answer uh, Benoit's question, uh, with the right intrinsics, I think that would be possible to uh, recreate a, a, a room. Um, I have not tried it. I haven't seen anybody try it. So I, I, it would be challenging. I don't think it would be perfect, but I almost think it would be better to have multiple images uh, than a 360 uh, hemispheric photo. Uh, but with the, with the correct intrinsic settings, it, it theoretically should be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as you uh -huh. can see from the images, we the, the images like if you look here, that's super funny because you can then mix and match having semantic prediction, uh, and without semantic prediction, oh, it's not here because I sampled too heavily, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Let me rerun it. Uh, let me rerun it. Okay. And normally we will be able to compare the with and without prediction. Hope you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's without the semantics and that's with the semantics. So super interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So you can see you, there is a lot of ways we can experiment now with this sort of things. Um, like I have another model here, which is not depth anything and produces not quite as good results here. Uh, it's already very good, uh, even if coming from, uh, let's say, a surveying, surveying mindset, you, you, you may not use it directly. You need to constrain it a lot more before, before it's usable. Um, just to finish up right. and then we'll move on to the raw side of things, maybe, um, mm -hmm. to, clarify, to clarify why we are doing that and why we're investing so much time to prepare that, to test it, to beta test all this architecture is, like right now, I really feel like uh, th there is, a lot of opportunities in the space. It's more than a feeling. is is a, a concrete uh, market um, questions that I have like every day. How can we tune that for this application? How can I integrate that in my company and such? So the trick is getting this knowledge and transforming it into apply knowledge. So skills that you can really leverage. So that's the first thing. The second uh, element is that I work a lot. And I'm super happy to have Gaetano joined and also Jean-Jacques. And if you think you, you, you can contribute, I will be super happy to, to have you part of uh, the wonderful team is trying to dele delineate what is signal and what is noise. Uh, there is a lot of things coming in every day. It's very important to know what to pick up. Uh, it's super hard for me, so I can only imagine how hard it is for someone that is just in the space and has all this green lights everywhere. It's, it's, it looks amazing. But then when you, you, you try and take uh, that uh, to, to on your test bench, then everything fails. So yeah, hopefully we can cut a lot of time here uh, by giving and sharing what works and what should be avoided for now. After Absolutely. that, yeah. After that, there is this uh, learning engineering. This is also something that I thought I. I took that for granted, but I see that it's also something uh, uh, teaching. And I saw Edouard, Edouard, super happy to have you here because you could back up <laughs> what I'm going to say. So Edouard Verbi is also um, working at TU Delft and is also a professor there. And it's something super different to have um, teaching materials and experience for students uh, at the university or before that for bachelor compared to having professionals because in the community here, we have people coming from Airbus, from Google, from Meta, uh, from government agency, from um, the, the research uh, companies. And this is massive because they bring in so much expertise. And if you can plug that uh, to what you can share here, then you, you open a lot of things. And as I said, now the research just spans widely across what is only at the university. Um, and then, of course, uh, the last thing is I am super 
uh, especially with new things coming in, I'm super attached to to having the human centered um, ID and and trying to work around the journey. Even if I have more or less clear idea of where things are going, I think what is more important is growing all together. So yeah, that's the the the, the small let's say low <laughs> point around all of this way we are doing it. Um, how the knowledge is shared? You already know that most of you you have. A lot of things now open, so feel free to get there. I'm trying to push a lot to break down a bit the barrier between the differences between the, the, the way we live, depending on the country you are in. Uh, still, to make that happen, we need to finance, and that's through the production systems where we share uh, exactly system that you can pick up, copy paste for your applications through books, courses, or advisorships. So um, the deliverables, again, live session, full code, data set, resource, and handout, they are all part of this uh, live VIP workshop course. For now, there are already two chapters, one on 3D vectorization and one on 3D object detection with uh, KPCONF architecture, and now this one. Um, and the new ones that are coming in. So the idea is just after, if you can think already what you would like us to include, you do not need to get access to that. You have the recording, you will get the recording. It's just that if you want to support us and to speed up by getting the code and the resources and also having access to the other chapter, I will encourage you to get there, except if you are already part of the 3D collector pack and the 3D deep learning course, this is offered to you, so uh, don't get and 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 and, and uh, add that to your uh, card. So that's the link. Maybe I can um, put that in the um, how is it called the chat. And I can now thank you so very much again for being there. I see that we are right on time. But for the ones that are curious about what is behind, I suggest that we stay maybe ten minutes to first answer a bit the questions, and then after see how it plays for real time ROS integration with Python and spark maybe curiosity or see if that's something that you would like to integrate on your side. Um, I will just stop talking and maybe look at the at the question at this stage. Um, I can stop sharing my screen, I think, uh, and look at the questions if there are any. So, so, so. Um, do we have questions? So in the Q&A, Marco had one. Um, then for Andreas Schroff, image with mirrors are a challenge, I guess. What do you think, Gaetano? Um, where is that? I actually don't see the questions on my side for whatever reason. It's in the chat. Um, uh -huh. It's in the chat. So it's Andreas that asked about mirrors, if that's a challenge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, mirrors are always a challenge. Um, and I was, I you saw that in there. Um, yeah, in the little Ross demo, I actually have a mirror behind me, and I'll show you exactly how uh, that reacts. Um, no really good solution uh, for that right now. Um, uh, essentially, both uh, how LiDAR and how depth anything kind of sees mirrors as it sees it like it's seeing into another room like that becomes basically a room uh, instead of a flat uh instance um but yeah uh yeah. honestly not no great uh solution to that yet yeah but it's the same with active sensors eh? you you need to have mm -hmm. some kind of segmentation mask that will cool out what you do not want to predict and i think that will be the easiest answer um to that then there is the Question again of Benoit about if it's adapted to 360 semispheric photos, or is it best mm -hmm. to work with a set of flat photos to reconstruct an interior room, for example? Yeah, oh, I, I sort of answered that, but um, theoretically it should work. If your intrinsics uh, are correct, uh, you should be able to do a 360 photo, but right now I've, I've not seen that actually uh, done, um, so I would, Flat photos has been proven to work, so I, I guess that's kind of the way to go. All right, I think you can spin up your demo on Ross. I'm just looking at Marco. Um, Marco, uh, I'm insights. ready to go. Yep. Uh, perhaps we can move towards a single overview in terms of techniques versus quality. Mm -hmm. Something like full 3D lidar scanning and KPConf gives one to meter resolution, zero camera plus oh. four gives one to two centimeter to the camera depth. 
So it, it, it looks fantastic. Marco, uh, what, what I propose is maybe if you want to take the floor, I think you can uh, put on either your microphone and camera if you want to highlight, to make sure that I fully grasp it, but it, it seems super interesting, super interesting. Hi. Hi, Laurent. Thanks. Hi. Uh, well, I was thinking indeed because there's so many technologies and approaches and um, methodologies to work upon, I could imagine that you work backwards. So um, this is the resolution you would want, one to two millimeters. That means you need the full fledged uh, costly approaches. And if you can accept the rough setups, then you go for a little bit cheaper uh, approaches and you can start to make a little bit like a stepwise plan in terms of what would you need as a card client or customer. And then you can work backwards towards, OK, then this is the approaches which is reasonable. So you start from a end resolution and then you work your way back in terms of what technology and therefore code you would need. Would that make sense? Um, perhaps the group would be yeah, finding yeah, yeah. that useful. Super good idea indeed. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it helps a lot uh, putting up uh, like constraining a lot and uh, it would help definitely a lot of a lot of people to know exactly like kind of a mind map knowing okay that's my constraint this is the technique that is recommended you don't have to use it but it's recommended yeah yeah definitely and, and you mentioned also a stereo camera so that's also something of course um super interesting because you can do stuff how does it relate to single depth images uh working on it at the moment to to extract those insights Super good idea. Um, I will get on that, Marco, as soon as possible. And I think I will include it if you would like it. I will include it because the idea stems from you. So um, I think it's only fair that, uh, that, that that you are part of this process as well. <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, Thanks a lot. All right. uh, yeah. Uh, so let me let me throw my demo up really yeah. quick. Uh, so uh, Edward asked if I performed uh, some accuracy tests. Um, like I said, the depth is arbitrary. So I haven't done that yet. I was, I was planning on doing that with um, the metric depth model once I get that up and running. But I did do some quote unquote tests. And actually, when I throw my demo up, uh, which I'll do now, uh, you'll kind of see what they are. They're not they're not very scientific yet because this is all fairly new. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, so this is a sensor I designed. Um, it's got a Livox LiDAR. We're not using the LiDAR, and it's got a Luxonix AR0234 uh, camera, which is a, a got a global shutter. Um, it's about two megapixels. Um, fairly nice camera. This entire setup uh, that I designed is under three thousand dollars, so it's not insanely expensive for a, a sensor fusion uh, unit. I have designed some other ones uh, like this. Uh, Velodyne, um, that one I think is running about 15,000 or just real quick, this one, uh, which is the Velodyne Alpha, which I think are still going for about 90,000. So um, I, I have designed quite a few different ones, but we're going to be using the nice cheap one, uh, just the camera today. All right, sorry, real quick, here we go. Uh, share screen, entire screen, put that up. Um, here we go, get the camera up and running. We're just gonna do a ROS2 launch. Um, once I see that the camera is ready, camera ready, we're going to run the depth anything ROS code, um, which I will bring up and show you. So it's, 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 this code is still rough, not, not, uh, not ready for public viewing, but if you notice, we do a lot of the same processing and model stuff that I just showed you. Um, because of ROS, we got to create publishers and we got to create a subscriber, um, do a bunch of ROS stuff. We have to create fields for our point cloud. Um, this is XYZ RGB fields. Uh, I actually have the intrinsics uh, for my camera. Did some of the same stuff we did with intrinsics. Um, uh, uh, picks to meters. This is, uh, we did 100. I'm doing 50 here. Anyways, uh, hopefully someday we can get deeper into this ROS stuff, but actually let's... Uh, Let's just jump in and kind of see the demo. All right, I'm going to bring up Arvis, which is a um, ROS viewer. And here we go. This is my room. Let's get a better view with this camera. And it's because I wanted to get the mirror in there to kind of show you guys what mirrors do. So that is what mirrors do um, in here. But if we get a nice point of view of where I'm at, so, uh, 
we asked uh, what sort of tests I did. I actually I actually have a, a yardstick here. Um, and as we see, it's it's a little wobbly, not too wobbly, uh, but I don't currently have a uh, actual a measurement uh, sort of what Florent uh, talked about. I have some plans um, to uh, actually turn the LIDAR on and uh, then compare them, but not just compare them, perhaps uh, do some uh, convergions uh, where I uh, do some iterative closest point, some ICP to actually get the uh, parameters for depth anything uh, to get that scale value and the intrinsics to actually pop, pro uh, properly uh, project it uh, to the real world. We'll see if I get that up and running. Um, but anyways, yeah, so this is actually running. Uh, I wouldn't call it quite robotics real time um, in that uh, it's it's running at about three hertz. Um, but it is, it is, this is running in real time. Um, uh, robotics real time, uh, anything uh, less than 10 hertz, I wouldn't put on a self driving car. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so this, this is a technology that is well suited uh, to that. Um, once again, all Python code, uh, of course, uh, writing, rewriting a lot of it in C would speed it up a little bit. Um, but also uh, perhaps delving into some CUDA code could also uh, speed it up quite a bit. So anyways, uh, yeah, thank you all. If there's any more questions, I, I'm not in no rush, so I can stick around for a bit, um, but yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gaetano. This is awesome. It, it showcases exactly how powerful this is. Again, this is one image. This is one image, just the camera fit. This is not stereo mm -hmm. camera. So it's nope. amazing to, to see what we are getting at and the trajectory of things. So now it's really in perspective, how does LiDAR will compare to what we are getting with this kind of uh, uh, model? So is it not like totally switching now to processing uh, innovations and the hardware, how does it compare? Now it will, of, of course, can be uh, in it. Yeah, we. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> and uh, we, we saw so also the cat going in uh, everywhere, yeah. being very curious. Yeah. Um, Where's the dog too? <laughs> so come here. Super nice again, Gaetano. I just want to to say how happy I am that uh, yeah, part of the collector pack, how how much progression there is, and what you you're able to do uh, with all this thing. That's fantastic. It's, it gives a lot. Uh, yeah, it's it's super nice. Um, also, thank you very much for being so early. I know uh, it's 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 around <laughs> six six a.m. I think for you, so it's super early. Um, also, for the people in the Netherlands, I'm super aware that it's the. As you saw, this is fantastic. It opens up a bunch of possibilities that were really not there before having the ability to do depth estimation from single images. Still, there is a lot to achieve before we can use that for metric estimation and to have a consistency along different poses, for example. Nevertheless, it's incredible to have these kind of tools now at your fingertips, being able to code that with a few Python libraries. We had a blast with Gaetano. I hope you did too. Let's see each other for the next chapter. Bye-bye. <laughs>